All right. Welcome to 7.1 Properties of Electric Charge. This is the first part of Chapter 7, Electric Fields. Okay, this first lesson, it's um, a lot of it is review, and there's a lot of sort of words to write down. So I'm sorry for that in advance. Um, there's not a whole lot of math in this one. So, to start off, we want to talk about electric charge. The first, the most fundamental thing for electric charges is the law of electric charges, which says that opposites attract and likes repel. So that means if you have two positives, they'll, they'll repel each other. If you have a positive and a negative, they'll attract each other. All right, the next one here is the law of conservation of charge, and this says that charge can be transferred between objects, between objects, but the total charge in a closed system in a closed system is constant. So we can't create or destroy this charge just like we can't with energy. Um, that's the conservation of charge. Okay, and the other thing that we're talking about with charge is a unit called the Coulomb. That is capital C. That's how we talk about charge. And for reference here, an electron has a charge of um, negative E. E is a useful amount. Um, so E is equal to, well, negative E is, negative e is 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. Okay, and E is this useful sort of single unit of charge um, because our proton, our proton is equal to positive E, which is positive 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. There we go. So that's some, uh, some basic ideas of charge. And you can see, sorry, uh, the picture on the right there shows like charges uh, repel and unlike attract. All right, next one conductors and insulators. So a conductor is a substance where electrons move freely and an insulator is a substance where electrons don't move freely. Okay, so they're just sort of opposites there. Conductors and insulators. And everything, it's going to be somewhere on that scale. Nothing is a perfect conductor or a perfect insulator. All right, um, now there's some interesting things that happen with liquids and gases. You know that in liquids and gases, all the particles are moving around a bit. And the other thing that can happen is that substances can dissolve. into separate ions. And that's going to be useful for, um, for our charge. So for instance, in water, water, pure water H2O is an insulator. Electricity does not go through it, which might be surprising to you because we usually think of water as a conductor. Water by itself is an insulator, but if you have other things in it, like salt for instance, the salt, sodium chloride, separates into sodium and chlorine ions, which do have a charge, and they can ch uh, carry that charge very well. So, um, so that's the idea in liquids. And, and same, similar thing in gases can happen. Okay, to charge an insulator, well, if we have an insulator, something like glass, for instance, we can put a charge on there, but generally the electrons stay on the surface.
for an insulator. They stay where they are. They stay wherever we put them. They don't really move around. Whereas charging a conductor, the electrons distribute evenly into that conductor. Good. Okay, that's our discussion of conductors and insulators. Next topic. Charging objects. Different ways that we can charge objects. All right? And so we've got our first method here, method one. We can charge something by friction. This is rubbing things together. So what happens here is electrons transfer from one object or one material to another because they hold their electrons with different strengths. They hold their electrons with different strengths. So some objects really hold on to their electrons quite well and other ones don't and that determines how these electrons get transferred. And we have a way of sort of summarizing that called the electrostatic series and that's this thing on the right here. This is the electrostatic series and what it is it shows the relative strength Um, which is their hold on electrons of different materials. And so you can see there we have um, at the top a very weak hold on electrons all the way down to a very strong hold on electrons. That means that when you take any two things there and rub them together, the one that's further down the list will pick up the electrons and the one that's further up will lose them. So for instance, if we were to rub um, glass against silk, which is a very classic thing to do, this is um, one of the sort of labs that you can do is you rub them together and see what happens, uh, the glass is going to lose its electrons, it's going to become positive, and the silk will gain those electrons and become negative. Okay, so that's charging by friction. Number two here, charging by, um, by induced charge separation. And what this means is that if we bring a negative rod near neutral paper, a negative rod near neutral paper, and this is, this is just an example, by the way. Um, this is an example of how it works. It's not always going to be a negative rod, it could be a positive rod, and it doesn't need to be paper, but you bring something near something neutral, what happens is the electrons in the paper move away, they move away from, from the rod creating a positive region that's attracted to the rod. And there's two pictures to the right of that happening. So we have the the glass rod and the piece of paper and you can see that the charges the negative charges on the paper have moved away and we have all positive near where the rod is. And so it's kind of funny because that neutral paper is then becoming charged by that thing getting near it and then because it's charged all of a sudden it starts moving towards it. It becomes attracted to it. Um, even though overall that thing is still neutral. Okay, and there's another picture. I don't know if you can see it very well but there's a balloon in water and the balloon has been charged and you can see that the water running by is neutral but it's becoming again charged by induced charge separation which is making the water actually bend towards the balloon. Alright. 
Next page, this topic is grounding. And that's not, you know, at home being grounded, being sent to your room. Grounding is where we connect an object to the earth. To the earth. And I mean literally the earth. You could just stick a, a wire into the ground. That's what it is. Now, what this does is that the earth is so large that it can absorb or supply enough charge to make any object neutral. Enough charge to make any object neutral. It's basically this limitless supply of charge. So if you have something that's too negative, you touch it to the ground and all those electrons flow into the ground. And likewise, if it's too positive, it doesn't have enough el electrons, the Earth is more than happy to give it the extra electrons. So it's a useful thing to be able to do. Um, okay, so that's grounding. Now, charging by contact, this is sort of a new idea. So this is method number three to charge an object. Charging by contact. And this is when two objects touch... The charge on both objects will mostly balance. I'm putting mostly in brackets here. So that if something's way too negative and it touches something else that's neutral, some of those negative charges will go over to the other object. That's charging by contact. I said mostly because, well, you know, it depends on how conductive the materials are. It, um, even if it has excess charge, an object might not give it all up if it's not very conductive. It might not um, be able to let go of it. An, e an example of that is if you um, have a balloon and you rub it on your hair and then you stick it against the wall, well, it stays there, and that's both end up staying charged. They don't, um, they don't really fully balance out. Okay, so um, there's a picture here of a negative rod. You can see it has four electrons on there, and the metal that it's coming in near is uh, neutral. It touches the metal. They both end up with two each. They end up with two at the end. So you can see that that's charging by contact. And the last one that we have here is charging by induction. And this is kind of neat. So what charging by induction does is it combines induced charge separation and grounding. Induced charge separation and grounding. And I'm going to call this method number four. Your textbook sort of lumps this in with charging by contact, but it is different. Okay, so um, what th th the way this works is we can bring, again, this is an example, bring a negative rod near a metal. Then ground the metal. So what happens is the electrons flee right all the electrons are trying to get away from the negative rod so they're all leaving the the metal down into the ground the electrons flee um, into the ground 
Then we unground and what happens is the metal is now positive. Okay, and this is maybe the most um, hard to remember method, um, but it is important that you remember that this is possible. So if you have a negative rod, you know, obviously if I took that negative rod and touched it to the metal, I could make the metal negative. But I can also take that negative rod and I can make the metal become positive magically by using this method where I connect the metal to the ground. So without ever touching, and this is important here, that metal, that negative rod never touches the metal. It gets near it so that the electrons all run away. We connect it to the ground so that the electrons can actually get away entirely. Then we remove the ground and the, the object is now positive. Okay, that's the lesson. Um, like I said, it's all conceptual stuff, but do take a look at the homework, 1, 4, 7 to 9. There, they have some interesting questions. Thanks.